Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. We're going to start here with a look over the last 72 hours of total accumulated precipitation. Beginning in the west, we did pack up some snow in parts of the Cascades and the northern Rockies, and some of that snow even got down into the central Rockies there around the Four Corner states. But a pretty sizable change in temperature happened across the Great Plains in the Midwest as a front advanced through. And we did get quite a bit of snow on the back side of this, stretching from Nebraska through South Dakota and and uh, into Minnesota. As this particular front blasted through earlier this week, we did get quite a bit of severe weather here in parts of northern Illinois, including several reports of wind damage out of the squall line that passed through there. Well, that frontal boundary is now parked right here over parts of the mid-Atlantic down to the southeast. And as a result, some of the rainfall we've seen over the last 72 hours has easily topped three to six inches in some places there. And with the impacts of Ada, which have come over the parts of Florida and once again today are going to be going Going back over toward like Jacksonville, we're expecting to see the northern edge of the moisture from Ada really interact with that boundary and continue to produce a tremendous amount of rainfall for parts of the Mid-Atlantic and uh, the Carolinas. Now, let's go back to that snowfall discussion here. Looking back over the last three days, we can see that amounts across the mountains here generally hitting the 6 to 18 inch uh, marks. But then with the system that emerged earlier in the week, we picked up in parts of Nebraska, South Dakota, Minnesota, a wide swath of, of 4 to 8 inches of snow was some places even getting more than that. We did have some overrunning uh, here in parts of Nebraska and Iowa and Minnesota that give us some ice. And I want to thank Melanie for sending this into the National Weather Service at Omaha so we could share it here near Rising City. That is just to the west of Omaha, uh, south of the Platte River. And you can see that uh, they picked up a quarter inch of ice, maybe a little bit more. And uh, there was quite a bit of tree damage as a result of this. Now, this map is going to change quite a bit over the coming days as we see a lot of snow coming in to parts of the Pacific Northwest west with this next system that we're expecting and the all hazards weather map is already picking up on that we do see here that we have winter storm watches out for not only parts of the cascades but getting here into like the um, payette national forest this is near the sawtooth range this is also in the salmon river valley so we're going to watch this quite carefully a lot of high wind watches out as well come over to the other side of the country we do see widespread flash flood and flood watches and the tropical storm warnings here from ada as it cuts across florida today so those are going to be two of the main components of the flow. Now, why so much flooding happening in parts of the Carolinas? Well, let's take just a quick step up about a mile above our heads and notice we do have a high pressure uh, ridge that's sitting here out over the open Atlantic. So the flow is coming around it just like this and it is certainly feeding in the moisture from that direction. The frontal boundary is parked right in through here. And so what we end up having is this overrunning situation on a slow moving front and there is just a tremendous amount of moisture in this. It's partly being fed by what's happening here with Ada, but also just being fed by the moisture coming off of the Atlantic. On the other side, we come over here and see another high pressure cell sitting here north of Hawaii. And what's happening to the north of that in the Gulf of Alaska is there is a low that's going to be taking shape off the coast. So this is going to push a lot of moisture here into the Pacific Northwest and is going to be the setup for our next large system. That system will then come into the northwest, cut in through the Rocky Mountains and temporarily weaken before then emerging on the plains and developing into a large low that goes right over the Great Lakes states. And as it does so, it's going to be bringing in some big snow for parts of Ontario, Quebec, and it's also going to be bringing in a chance for storms along its southern edge on its front. So that's our setup. Let's get right on into looking at probably one of the most important maps for today. It's a map showing you precipitable water that tells us how much moisture is in the atmosphere that can be rained out or snowed out. And what I want to point out here is that this map is showing you precipitable water in terms of standard deviation. So when we look over here at how much moisture is tucked away on that stalled out boundary, also with Ada to the south, you can start to see that some of these numbers are up here near five standard deviations above the mean. So for those of you that you know like like hearing about the statistics of this, we're approaching you know record-setting territory here with how much moisture is going to sit on top of this, which is why there's the, all the flood issues that are going to be happening for the Carolinas getting up into Virginia today. Then notice this: we would call this an atmospheric river. Remember the flow was coming around in that direction on one side, and like this on the other, and so we're going to push this band of moisture into the northwest and it's going to really increase the snowfall amounts in the mountains and I'm going to show you that in just a few seconds. Near term though let's go to the high resolution NAM model and let's pause it right here early this morning. 
You can see the widespread rainfall we are seeing up here along the East Coast, stretching from Georgia clear to New York. And as I play this forward, watch right here through parts of Virginia, North and South Carolina for midday extremely heavy rainfall out of this combination of that frontal boundary, ADA, and then the moisture coming off of the high pressure cell sitting over uh, the, um, the Atlantic. Now, while that's taking place through midday, we could see coming through uh, parts of uh, uh, South Dakota, Nebraska, getting into this corner of Iowa and Minnesota, some light snow. Saw it on the radar early this morning. Letting this play forward, that light snow then moves across the state this afternoon over into parts of Wisconsin. Could get some showers to the south of it. But we will see by late this afternoon and this evening, the heaviest rains move toward the coast here in the Carolinas. Now that moves out, Ada gets offshore here, and things begin to calm down tonight for parts of the Carolinas through Virginia. Meanwhile, our weak front kind of moves right here through the Great Lakes, spreading some light snow with some cooler rain to the south of it that goes over parts of Michigan as we get into the early morning tomorrow. But the next piece of this pattern comes in here into the Pacific Northwest. And as it does so, we saw how much moisture was in it. It's really going to push over the mountains, increase a lot of valley rain here. And yes, it will extend into parts of Northern California through the Sacramento Valley. But we're going to add a lot of snow to the Cascades, the Northern Rockies, the Blue Mountains here. It'll really be piling up where we currently have a deficit in snowfall in this part of Idaho. And this is going to push through once we get here into Friday evening into the overnight hours on Friday and early Saturday. But something to note here is that as this system pushes through, it was a big one when it hit the coast, you don't see much of it. And what's happening here is there's an issue with the timing of the jet stream winds and the jet stream position that's going to give us a brief break before all of this reinvigorates, meets this lead wave here on Saturday morning, which could produce some widely scattered showers in through here, maybe a mix of precipitation uh, in this part of Illinois and Iowa early Saturday morning before all of this comes together and hammers parts of uh, the Great Lakes state. So we'll take a look at that in just a few moments. Now, tropics first. We did have the naming of uh, Tropical Storm Theta earlier this week, which makes 2020 uh, the record setter now for the most number of named systems. And we could possibly see the naming of Tropical Storm Iota here uh, in the Caribbean. That is uh, would be our next name. And the National Hurricane Center has given that a 90% chance of forming. So here we go. Ada. Theta going toward the Iberian Peninsula and what could be Iota here going right towards Central America. Now remember, Ada hit right here last week, producing a lot of widespread flooding and damage. And so this would be a bad situation for parts of Central America as these tropical thunderstorms begin to organize and head toward that same region. I got asked a great question yesterday, so I just wanted to address it. These are all the names we've used so far this year. And just look down here. We've had 29 named systems, which makes 2020 the new record holder for the number of named systems. But it's important to keep a season in context, and that's what I want to do for you. So we're going to look at a graphic here showing you ACE. That stands for Accumulated Cyclone Energy. And normally, this would be the rate at which we accumulate that energy throughout the year, hitting somewhere around 100 units of ACE by the end of the season. We're currently sitting at 163. But this year, having the most named systems, what's important to know here is that we're only about 60% above average on our ACE. Now, the year that we broke the record from 2005 had 245 units of ACE. So what I'm trying to illustrate is that particular year, 2005, had a lot of storms, but several of them were very, very intense. And as a consequence, the 2005 total accumulated cyclone energy number is worth about an additional hurricane season on top of what we've seen in 2020. So that's just important to understand here. And the 2020 season in terms of ACE doesn't even make the top 10 list here. So this has been a season with a lot of weaker systems. Now, I don't want that to distract from what it's done because you know that we've had 13 of these that have either hit the United States or brushed the United States. And as a result of that, from parts of the lower Mississippi River Valley through the Tennessee and Ohio Valley, cutting across parts of the Cotton Belt over to the Carolinas and Virginia, we are right now, year to date, sitting easily at a surplus of greater than 10 inches. And that's normally what I keep this map at. It goes from minus 10 inches to plus 10 inches on the year to date numbers. So it's been extremely wet in the southeast. Feel free to pause this video and take a look at some other things here, like how dry it was at times in the northeast. We can see the drought here in this part of the Corn Belt that's set up and very, very dry conditions across the west. In that case, record setting as well. 
Okay, let's get into what's going to happen here with this pattern moving forward. And I'm going to take you straight to the jet stream level winds. So the colors here represent the speed and the uh, uh, contour lines kind of tell you the direction. Now, what we're going to watch as I get this playing here is the nose of this jet is going to pound into the Pacific Northwest throughout the day on Friday. And that is what's going to be bringing in that stream of moisture and really get things cranking. As we then get into the weekend, an interesting thing happens. We do see a trough cutting through here. And normally we would associate this trough with development of a low pressure system. But to really make it intensify here in the central plains, we would need to see these fast winds which extend from here through here. I'd want them to already have cut underneath this trough. Therefore, we could combine the curvature effect of the flow with the jet streak effect to basically give a strong upper level divergence and make a, a big low. Where's that going to happen? Well, it won't happen until Sunday morning once it gets here over Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. And that's where the trough really has the fastest winds right there in its base. And that's going to give us outstanding upper level support right here. That's where the best upper level divergence will be to create a low over the Great Lakes states. And that low is going to intensify as it races there through Ontario and Quebec and then move quickly into the Northeast. Now watch what happens to the jet stream after that. This is Monday getting into Tuesday and now into Wednesday. A broad ridge begins to build back in the midsection of the country. So a kind of a boring time period here, middle of the week next week, as we see the next trough kind of cutting into this area. So part of the week two precipitation pattern could see, you know, some additional rainfall right here in the midsection of the country, given this pattern. But this is not one that brings in tons of excess of rainfall as we look out into the week two, especially down here from Texas all the way over to the coast. So that's what your jet stream is going to be doing. Let's now go right to the European model to see what we expect. Now we've already watched this through the first 60 hours. So I'm going to pause it here on Saturday morning. Now there's a big high pressure cell sitting right over the state of Ohio. And there will be on the south side of it plenty of moisture advection. Look at how strong these winds are going to be in through here. Our first system has already pummeled the west. It's come into the northwest and is now getting ready to go into that, like I said, reset mode. So as we work our way from Saturday morning into Saturday afternoon and evening, the transport of that moisture north will be happening around these two centers of low pressure, one here and one here, that will be coming together by the time we get into Sunday morning over this, uh, really, Lake Michigan here, right over Green Bay. Very low pressure. Now, look at the pressure gradient around this. Very strong winds across a broad sector here of North America because of this low. And as we talked about, that's going to intensify and move toward the Northeast quickly through parts of Ontario and into Quebec. We do expect to see chances of storms here uh, once we, as the system uh, gets going and then pushing to the East, as you see here throughout the day on Sunday. But I'm talking extremely powerful winds. Now, for many of us in atmospheric sciences, when we see a low cutting across Lake Superior like this, it often makes us think of one of our, our favorite weather songs, which is The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald by Gordon Lightfoot. And so we're going to expect to see a, a Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald type storm going across parts of the Great Lakes this weekend, really on Sunday. Well, that then pushes through Ontario. It's going to be a tough call as to finding where that snow uh, rain boundary is going to be. But remember, this is a very productive region in terms of ag productivity here. And so it's going to be a tricky forecast. Behind this, some cold air initially. And you can see the lake effect snow coming off as superior all the way here over to uh, you know Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. So expect that on those windy conditions. But now we see high pressure building on the backside. And as that high pressure settles in, we're going to wait on the next system to come in here middle of the week next week, hitting the Pacific Northwest. And this is that boring time period where the jet stream just kind of flatly grows across the country and maybe even ridges a little bit here in the center before the things really kind of maybe change up for the day 10 to day 15 time period. So we got to get through this weekend with this large system and then things calm down a little bit. Well, not necessarily in terms of winds, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. So let's watch how much precipitation accumulates here. We're working our way now through Saturday into Sunday. Here's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of next week. So we can see that through the Cascade Mountains, easily picking up several inches of rain with a lot of snow here. It will get into parts of the Columbia Basin, and it's going to hit parts of northern and central Idaho pretty hard. We will get quite a bit of precipitation through the Klamath Mountains and also into the Sacramento Valley, but not much in the San Joaquin and farther south. Remember, where everything is resetting, 
it's going to be dry here in the midsection of the country. But then possibly from Missouri to Illinois, Indiana, this will be an area we could see a three quarters of an inch to an inch plus of rainfall. And then this is what's leaving today in this area. Snowfall. This is, or excuse me, before I get to snowfall, this is just looking at that same map comparing things to normal. So what you, what I wanted you to see here was that parts of the Northwest in the Carolinas through Virginia are going to be seeing an additional two to five inches of rainfall in the next seven days here. Now let's talk about that snowfall. Cascades picking up three to four feet. Northern Rockies easily 12 to 24 inches of snow here. Could see some snow right in through this area. Not a lot coming out of the Canadian prairies but once you get over in Ontario there'll be a wedge in through here where we could expect to see anywhere between six to 15 inches of snow. So that's what we're getting and don't forget that lake effect that's coming through after this. All right. One last thing about this near-term pattern, the winds. As I let this play forward, as the nose of that jet comes in, look at the surface winds here. Throughout the day on Friday, we could be getting gusts in parts of Oregon, topping 60 to 70 miles an hour. And as that low takes shape over the weekend, this is now through Saturday evening, some strong downslope flow right in through here. But as we go now into Sunday, Sunday afternoon and evening into early next week. As that low comes cutting across here, we will see very strong winds gusting 30 to 50 miles an hour across a broad sector here of North America. So just prepare for that as you work through the weekend into early next week. All right, when we get out to day 10, remember the jet stream is going to be doing something a bit like that, but we don't see any you know, really well-defined trough, troughs and ridges. And so I just think we're going to see a lot of next week, the flow coming across the country like this. But then we go back into that mode we've been talking about. More troughs developing here, cutting into the Pacific Northwest, which tends to keep us warmer here across the eastern half of North America. I'll show you that in a moment. First, though, precipitation anomalies into week two. We do anticipate drier conditions here. With the jet stream doing something like this, maybe wetter here and wetter there as well. But this is compared to normal, and these anomalies are not strong. So that's what the week two pattern looks like all the way through Thanksgiving. From here, let's talk temperatures. Max temperatures first. So this is looking at the day today on Thursday. You can find the frontal boundary pretty easily here. Pressing forward, this is now getting into the day on Friday. Comparing to normal here, that's what the colors do. There's Saturday, the warm up coming with the strong southerly winds ahead of the next big system. You can see it moves east on Sunday. And then as we go from Sunday into Monday, that's where the cold air sweeps across the Great Lakes. And like I said, could get during the cooler hours of the day, some lake effect snow. But really past this Monday into Tuesday and Wednesday, we don't see, you know, major deviations from normal. Yeah, there's a nice warm up happening midweek next week for the Plain States uh, as that uh, ridge builds in. But it's not like we just saw where we were near record setting territory with the heat. From there, let's go out to the day five through 10 time period. A lot of the cold air is really getting stored up here through the Canadian prairie, warmer across a broad sector here of the United States as that ridge pulls in. We've got to let the cool air exit east first, so we're going to continue to hang out of that cooler bias across the east. But the day 10 through 15, about the only thing I'd like to mention here is that the models did back off on the widespread warmth, taking those temperatures back over toward normal as we approach uh, Thanksgiving here. Okay, From that point moving forward, let's finish up by talking about South America. On the left, a latest map from GRACE, that's a satellite that measures uh, root zone soil moisture, does it by measuring minute fluctuations in gravity. And what you can see here is that we've been quite dry in southern Brazil. There's patchy dryness in parts of like Mato Grosso and parts of Argentina have been dry as well. I wanted to compare that to a map I generated this morning that looks at the last 30 days in terms of percent of normal precipitation. So about the only places where the, the rain gauges are picking up on wetter than average conditions are really in northeastern Brazil. So we would say that there's still deficit despite rapid planting progress in Mato Grosso, southern Brazil, and parts of Argentina. Uh, Buenos Aires, we do see some wetter conditions here, but I think this is due to one reporting station showing up there. So what I want to point out to you is that over the last week, let's just keep an eye on this area. Several days of drier conditions with maybe more, more normal monsoonal flow here in Mato Grosso. We had one push at decent precipitation that came through parts of you know, southern Brazil and Argentina. But remember, this is a satellite-based measuring technique. So seeing how much rain we actually got out of this and it was it really kind of corrective on the longer-term drought issues will be uh, yet to be seen. So here's what we need to see. Over the next week, it will be wetter in through this area. All right, scattered showers in Mato Grosso, but dry, 
down here in Rio Grande do Sul, Uruguay, and this part of Argentina, which is the most important part for uh, ag, uh, corn, soybeans, things like that. Into week two, as the MJO stops over in phase two, it's wet north in Brazil, excuse me, in the Amazon. But if you come here from Mato Grosso do Sul through southern Brazil and Argentina, models continue to call for the drier pattern. And that is going to be a story that we're going to watch for all of this winter for North America as the southern uh, South American growing season really gets ramped up. Okay, have a great rest of your week, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.